singularity. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular podcast feature of Singularity Weblog, where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. As you may already know, my name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and as always, I will be the man with the questions. Before we begin our show today, I would like to take just a minute to remind our viewers and listeners uh, that if you guys really enjoy watching this show, uh, please feel free to express uh, your feelings in one out of two ways. Uh, Number one, you can go to iTunes and write up a good review for the show, which would help us greatly in terms of ranking the show and popularizing it and spreading the word for it and therefore bring more people to see it and enjoy it, hopefully as much as you do. And number two is, of course, feel free to go to our donate uh, uh, page on singularityweblog.com or simply click um, on the sidebar uh, tip jar where it says Tip Socrates and uh, feel free to support the show. Now that we have uh, gone through that, it's time to welcome our guest for a second time, Dr. Rando Kuna. Hi, Rando. Hi. Welcome back to the show. Yeah, it's great to be here again. So, uh, Rando was already once on the show, and for those uh, of you who perhaps missed that episode, I highly recommend it. Uh, Dr. Kuna is um, a director, the director of analysis at Halcyon Molecular and co-founder of Carbon Copies and co-founder of and director at the Neuroengineering Corporation of Massachusetts. His research objective is whole brain emulation, that is creating the large scale high resolution representations and emulations of activity in neuronal circuitry that are needed in, for for example, in patient specific neuroprosthesis. So I believe you guys would enjoy enjoy the previous show very much and hopefully um, this one will be even better because today we have only one topic that we need to discuss, but it is a very important topic and that is the ethical issues surrounding mind uploading. So let me uh, start our discussion, Rando, by asking you, from your point of view, as the neuroscientist who is working in the field, what are the sort of daily, or are there any daily ethical dilemmas or issues that you're considering when you're approaching your work? Well, the daily ethical dilemmas are usually of the nature of, say, um, what kind of intellectual property do you share? Uh, Who gets to collaborate on a project? Uh, Where does the information go? If you're collecting personal information, what sort of information can you uh, connect to a person's identity and where does that go? So it's it's a lot of the same sort of stuff that you would come across in any project these days, any, uh, let's say, uh, the personal genome project is one of those examples where people have to basically choose to give up their privacy and, and make things open. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of the same questions come along when you're thinking about either neural interfaces, brain-computer interfaces, whole brain emulation, um, or anything that's related to individual people, to, to humans, as human candidates, human subjects, uh, people who want to participate in a collaborative study. Um, I think that's not particularly novel. That's just one of the things that we bump into all the time. Okay, so so if we if we sort of move up a step higher or zoom out, sort of, what are the general, perhaps longer term or lo- really long term uh, ethical issues that you should you think all people working in your field should be considering, and that you are perhaps considering in the longer mm-hmm. term basis? Yeah. There are very many. Uh, We could look at them on a wide spectrum. We can look at, for example, the issue of rights. Um, What sort of rights do humans have to the information in their brains? Is it all right to make a hundred copies of what is inside your head? Who gets to own that? Who says what happens to it? There is the matter of um, what sort of rights do you give to these uh, whole brain emulations, whatever kind of existence they have, whether they are living inside a virtual reality, whether they're living in a new body, in a robot body, um, what sort of um, economies are going on. We know, for example, from the talks that Robin Hansen gives that he has a lot of uh, scenarios where he paints uh, a world in which you have um, low-wage 
uh, whole brain emulations working en masse for a few very wealthy corporations or people. So there are all sorts of issues f from uh, along this spectrum and probably many more and, and even the issue of access. Who gets to do this? Who gets to upload when? And um, Does everyone get to have a whole brain emulation done or is this something that's only done by choosing a select few people that we consider the best for the procedure or something like that? Mm -hmm. So there's the access issue uh, and what is it being done for? Is it considered a medical procedure? Is it considered uh, a way of preserving your own existence? Or is it considered a means of creating something like an artificial general intelligence? Mm -hmm. And when you combine that, when you put that in the picture as well, there's the question, what is the difference between a whole brain emulation and an artificial general intelligence? Um, would we give rights to artificial general intelligence? Do we have to worry about the rights of those who do not choose to participate in something like whole brain emulation? Does the existence of a program such as Holbrin emulation threaten people who don't want to participate? Um, should some things be banned or not be banned? Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to even begin to explain how many ethical qu questions there are. There are ethical and moral questions and just cultural questions, mm -hmm. things where, where we have to decide. Uh, which direction we want to go. So is there, for example, a, a body of work or some kind of a ethical guideline system that uh, is to serve the people in your field? Or is it sort of a one-on-one um, -on -one kind of basis, basically your own personal ethics uh, that are the determining factor? Because, mm. I mean, I'm aware this is very cutting-edge uh, science, so I would personally imagine that legislation and, and sort of government regulation is very much behind the curve. But I want to ask you, is there anything outside of, you know, your own ethical, personal ethics that could guide a researcher in your field, legally or ethically or otherwise? I mean, I'm sure there yeah. are legal uh, constraints, but... Ethic, ethical. Well, as you already said, these sort of things, they lag behind, and they really do. Um, the only thing that's out there is, of course, that which exists currently for humanity at large, so human rights in a sense. That is out there as a guideline, and then what you can do is you can try to extrapolate, extrapolate from that. But it's difficult to say where you should or should not extrapolate, and that's why I brought up the issue of artificial general intelligence, because we don't generally go about doing that, though perhaps we should. And I don't believe there are any guidelines there either at the moment. Um, the only thing that, that I know outside of my own uh, thoughts about the matter is, is basically participating in groups uh, where people discuss these questions. So you, you could talk, for example, to people at the Future of Humanity Institute, or you could talk to people who are involved in online discussion groups that are interested in moral and ethical issues. Mm -hmm. Now, on the positive side, it's probably still going to take quite a few years until we have any of these whole brain yeah. emulations or artificial general intelligences. So we have a little bit of time to work on those questions. And sort of but, catch up, yeah. And yes, true. We, we, but but I, just let me throw in for a second sure, there that absolutely. even though I said that, some things happen much faster. Mm -hmm. Because even as we're going in that direction, you for instance have augmentation where you have either someone who has a new Google glasses on and can see all sorts of things in real time and use that to their advantage, let's say for example as a lawyer in a courtroom mm -hmm. and they may have an advantage over the other lawyer who doesn't have these glasses on um, and you've got people such as uh, this, this South African runner Pretorius with his yeah. cheetah blades and then people are complaining well he shouldn't be in the Olympics because he's much faster than people with regular legs so mm -hmm. even though we don't have whole brain emulation and we don't have artificial general intelligence we're slowly creeping up that curve and we're bumping into some issues that we don't have any rules for yet mm -hmm. Yeah, just as a side note on that, uh, last uh, episode I interviewed Dr. Uh, Professor Linda McDonald Glenn, and she's not only a bioethicist but also a practicing lawyer, um, and she was sharing some of her previous experience uh, with some of her clients, and she had a specific case in which uh, she had a, a person who was either a full amputee or a paraplegic, I cannot remember, but basically from legal point of view, they were arguing that the chair, the mechanical chair that the individual was using was literally a part of him because he could not function properly without it. Therefore, mm -hmm. the distinction between his body 
and the chair because the chair got damaged when he was on an airplane and basically the air company was like, well, we, we damaged his property. And, and their argument was, no, you actually damaged a lot more than his property because while it was damaged for a year, he was basically bedridden. He could not do anything in the meantime because that's his legs, that's his mode of transportation, that's yeah. everything, that's part of him, literally. So I think, back to your point, the legislation and those legal precedents are sort of coming step on a step-by-step -step basis and, and are going up sort of the, the range. Uh, but let me grab one of those issues that you mentioned and use it as a launching pad, perhaps. Now, you mentioned access. Yeah. Uh, access is always a very charged, very political issue, if you will, because the argument goes that, you know, death used to be the great level leveler. So it didn't matter whether you're a king or, you know, a pauper, eventually you will die. And in death, we're all equal in a way because we all die. Now, mm. the, the idea presumably goes that if we are, if you are successful and people like you are successful in home brain, whole brain emulation projects and eventually mind uploading, then the rich would conquer death while the poor would continue to die. And therefore that, you know, old argument that death is the great leveler, you know, go in the dustbin of history. So what do you want to say about that? as an ethical issue, clearly very powerful and polarizing issue. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, like you'll probably hear most people say, ideally, we would love everyone to have access to every technology. So, for example, we would like everyone to have access to the best healthcare available and the best surgeons available and the best medicine available and to uploading when it's available. Um, the realities are not often shaped just by what people want, but mostly by what's available, what the resources are, what the politics are, um, and of course what the laws are. And I mean, I, you said that in the past, uh, death was the great equalor, equalizer, but of yeah. course this wasn't entirely true because the pauper had an average lifespan of maybe 16 or 18, and the, <laughs> the nobleman had an average lifespan of something like 40 or 50. Yeah. So. Um, that wasn't true even then. Um, but the idea but, goes that, but, you know, yeah. you're, you're dead forever. So if you're alive for 16 or 40 years, since you're it dead forever, it doesn't uh, really make Well, you can difference. probably still apply that because, uh, as I've probably pointed out the last time we spoke, I find the, the concept of immortality a very strange concept to have because, first of all, you cannot really imagine any technology, or at least I can't, that would that would preserve your life regardless what happens, no matter how long you look into the future. So there's always going to be more time where you don't exist than time in which you do exist. And the other point is that uh, um, if you change enough, let's say that, that you start making a lot of modifications, at which point do you say that you still survived or did you just change into something completely different? So where do you draw the line and say this is the end of your life or does it continue? And how is that different from you know, at what degree, at what point do you say this is different from continuing through your children or through your works or something? So it's all very, there's a lot of nuance and stuff. And I don't like the word immortality for that reason. Mm -hmm. Because it, it may, assumes, assumes infinities that, that simply are not being provided by that technology. Mm -hmm. But let me, let, so I will come back to that issue about uh, is it you or is it not you? Because that's a very important issue and it's also an ethical issue. But, but let me just give you a scenario about how if, the research you're working on uh, is successful, I think it's clearly a case of immortality because if you can do one mind upload, um, then in a way that's like a backup, right? You do regular uh, sort of, uh, you, you do one mind upload, say something happens to that specific individual, right? And there's an accident and, you know, they're deceased. Then you simply recreate the, the latest sort of backup copy and you instant instantiate it in a new body and then you keep going and as long as you have sort of a fresh backup copy of it then uh, you can certainly argue uh, that you are immortal for, for all intensive purposes because uh, just like you know uh, your computer goes in for recycling hopefully or in the garbage in some cases but the software moves from the old hardware to the new hardware and you mm. all have all your latest files and stuff like that but there's a continuum 
between the software on the old one and the new the new one you're still mm. feeling like this is your own computer you know you know where things are it only works a little better and a little faster but it's your computer it's just on a different box yeah uh, I'm very uncomfortable assuming immortality because immortality assumes that you're going to be alive infinitely even if you can make backups sure that will take care of some sorts of things that kill you but not everything it doesn't uh, immediately safeguard you from and supernovas it doesn't you know mm -hmm. it just makes it that you live a lot longer but it doesn't necessarily say you're going to live forever in fact i don't know how you could live forever because how are you going to outrun you know entropy and mm -hmm. uh, things like that so yeah it, that hasn't that's not the total solution i mean you'll have more time to come up with another solution perhaps but that's not the total solution uh, absolutely but i mean from our point of view let's say average lifespan right now is in the 80s yeah. if somebody lives say i don't know 100,000 years or a million years that's almost forever from our point of view i think okay so for that's where the, the when you use the words for all intents and purposes that's kind of like saying well you know, yeah, so, you know, if we look at it from our point of view, it seems like it's forever because it's very long. Yeah. And, and okay, sure, we can go with that. Yeah. And yes, in terms of entropy, I mean, you know, the, the sun probably has, what, another five billion or six billion years left. You know, if we are having, say, a billion or two billion years, I think we might be able to prepare ourselves for such an event. Oh, sure, sure. Not. I'm not saying that there aren't other plans you can take. It's just that if you just sit here and all you do is make a whole brain emulation, uh -huh. that doesn't solve your, immortal your, your mortality problem. It just gives you a backup. That's all. Absolutely. You, if you just make the upload right here, all you need is maybe an earthquake and, and your device is destroyed and you're destroyed with it and that's it. It's, you always need to make other plans as well if you want to extend your life beyond that. Yeah. So, I am reading yeah. a couple of science fiction books, um, one uh, which are both related to uh, mind uploading. One of them was Cory Doctorow's Up and Down in the Magic Kingdom, I think it was called. I read it a few mm. months ago, and it's about Disney World, believe it or not. Uh, but um, it's about uh, uh, a murder case uh, of a mind uploaded individual uh, who gets, you know, re-instantiated after he was killed and then he starts sort of investigating his own murder um, uh, and there's of course many other suggestions that you know you can send backups of you to the dark side of the moon or out of the galaxy or something and then you can sort of beam the information whenever you need it so even if the planet gets destroyed you still have a backup somewhere at a safe distance and so on. Okay. Currently, I'm reading another fascinating book exactly on the topic, which I started reading specifically for our interview to give me a sort of a broader look called uh, Mind Scan. It's written by Robert J. Sawyer. Um, and I'm about halfway through because <laughs> yesterday was Easter, but I have to say it's, it's a fascinating read. So let me just uh, go back in the beginning here and, and ask you um, how do you get? to work on your whole brain emulation uh, project in the sense of do you have volunteers uh, because you've mentioned the, the DNA project and we know that some of the people involved with it very early basically volunteered to lose their privacy as you put it yourself mm -hmm. so that yeah. they can put their own genome out there. Uh, do yeah. you have something similar? Uh, do you use volunteers for whole brain emulation? We have something similar. It's called animals. Um, we're not working with humans. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's the truth of it. Nobody is doing anything like whole brain emulation research on humans at the moment, mm -hmm. um, except beyond basic neuroscience, just mm -hmm. trying to understand uh, what's going on in human minds. But really, even there, almost everything is animal work. Um, the point, though, is being that we think that the kind of technology you need is pretty much the same for an animal brain and a human brain, so it's okay to use animal models as a way to develop those tools. But is it the same? Is it just a difference of a, say, a few orders of magnitude or is there more to it from a neuroscientific point of view? There are all sorts of differences, but from the point of view of what you need to do with the technology, which is uh, in the roadmap that I've pointed out in a number of talks recently, mostly a matter of acquiring the structural connectome and acquiring a high resolution set of characteristic reference points for the functional um, characteristics uh, so that you can make the system identification problem 
a, a, a set of small system identification problems rather than one really large complicated system identification problem. Mm -hmm. um, that's the same for any kind of brain. It doesn't really matter whether the neurons are slightly larger or slightly smaller, whether there's more space between them or not, and exactly how they're connected, because you need to it's like uh, if you need to scan an entire page at 500 dots per inch, it really doesn't matter exactly what's printed on that page, so long as you still scan it at 500 dots per inch. So that is an analogy to the kind of tool that you need for whole brain emulation. In the end, it doesn't really matter very much which type of brain you're working with. You can still develop the same type of tool. Of course, uh, the amount of data you need to scan is much higher yeah. in a human brain. And that does become an issue because then you need to develop tools that are highly parallelized, that have, for example, very many microscopes at the end. It's that sort of thing that you uh, that you have to concern yourself with. And that's exactly the kind of question that Ken Hayworth is occupying himself right now because he has a machine that is uh, sufficient to do the structural connectome uh, acquisition for a very small brain, let's say something from a, a Drosophila, one of those fruit flies. But if he wanted to scale this up to humans, he needs to build an entirely different machine which will slice up pieces of brain in a, in a way that it can be automatically shunted to many different microscopes and things like that. Mm -hmm. So then you get extra technical complications. I see. Speaking of a you know, sufficiently powerful machine, uh, what's the kind of a machine that you would require probably for a full whole brain human, human that is whole brain emulation? What do you mean by machine? Do you mean the sort of thing that you're emulating on or the yeah, thing that's exactly. using to acquire the data? Uh, oh, well, it, it, so, it so happens that, that we, did a, we did an interesting calculation, or rather I did, uh, recently for, um, for a proposal that we're putting together. And for that, we needed to come up with um, a, good, a good way of estimating what the computational requirement was. And we were trying to be conservative. So what we did is we assumed that what we're trying to accomplish is we're trying to be able to replicate or predict the spiking behavior of the system, uh, but we wanted to be able to do so with characteristic action potentials. So we model every single neuron by using compartmental models so that you have, say, 10,000 compartments representing the three-dimensional model of a neuron, and using Hodgkin-Huxley equations for the action potentials, and using, say, 10 parameters for each one of the compartments, and then going through that entire thing using that as the model but looking at how many actual potentials can happen within a specific period of time in the brain, then how much would that require in computation? So how did we figure out how many spikes could happen or how many actual potentials per period of time? We looked at what is the energy that's being provided to the brain and how much ATP, how much energy, does a single action potential require? Mm -hmm. When you do all those calculations, in the end you find out that if you're going to model it as a compartmental model like that, a whole brain emulation for 86 billion neurons requires about one exaflop. So that's not petaflops even, that's, and that's what current uh, supercomputers are doing, but an exaflop. Yeah. That sounds like an awful lot, but on the other side, uh, all the countries that, that are participating in supercomputer developments, like the US, Europe, India, they all have plans to accomplish exaflop computing by somewhere between the year 2017 and 2020. So that's not that far away. And this was entirely conservative. This was the idea of using a compartmental model, of doing modeling of the action potentials themselves, and of, um, of using a regular supercomputer instead of, for instance, switching to a neuromorphic architecture, which would be a much better match to the task. So in reality, it's, it's probably going to be quite different, and it's going to be somewhat faster and easier to do and much smaller than a huge exaflop supercomputer. But that was just a worst-case scenario. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of computing it would require, yeah. Yeah, uh, actually, um, I recently published just a short news article on Singularity web blog about uh, a supercomputer that's called Dome uh, that IBM and Astron are going to build for the Square Kilometer Array radio telescope by 2024. And it is an exascale computer because to be able to process uh, the data coming from, you know, the Square Kilometer radio telescope, you need an equally powerful computer that can aggregate all that data and sort of put it together to get a single picture, and it's an exascale computer. Uh, and that's a sort of a private organization even, it's not like probably by that time I would imagine the military, the Pentagon, a bunch of other organizations would have more powerful computers than that. 
so exaf exaflop compu exascale computers are coming our way probably within five ten years perhaps I think um, but let's so let's get back to the ethics so ima imagining that the, or assuming that we would have the hardware to run everything safely on the question then uh, comes back to be again an ethical one and that is um, you raised the, the issue of uh, slavery, for example, or you, you kind of mentioned it, but wouldn't it be slavery if we sort of create an active working whole brain emulation on a computer somewhere, which is basically literally a brain in a vat, uh, in a virtual vat, if you will. And I'm sorry, could you rephrase, could you repeat one part of that question? Because I just lost my, um, yeah. the little plug in my ear for a second there. No problem. So, so assuming that we have all the hardware required to make uh, whole brain emulation a reality, uh, yeah. would it not be slavery if we succeed in it? Because we, in that case, we would have created a whole brain in a vat, if you will, in a virtual vat somewhere on a computer which is sort of separate from the real world and which we could basically uh, turn off and therefore kill any time that mm. we, f we feel like we've done our work on. So is that the kind of um, uploading or the kind of Holborn emulation that you would like to have done? I mean, would you like to end up in a vat? I, I personally not. Uh, certainly not, but but I'm I'm just concerned that in order for uh, the full brain or proper uh, mind upload to occur, the first step would probably happen in a lab with a sort of a uh, that kind of scenario where you do it on a on yeah. a emulated that, brain. Yeah, I find it extremely unlikely that that's what one would do to a human brain. Now, I think it's very likely that the first version of an uploaded Drosophila brain might be something along the same along those lines um, but in the case of a human I mean just even for the ethical reasons as you described that would be yeah. really weird that's that's uh, that's like uh, cutting off your head or something like that and, and just keeping it somewhere in a box uh, I don't see that anyone would want to have that done or uh, would volunteer to be the, the the first candidate for a procedure like that well, there um, are people who volunteer for all kinds of strange things. Uh, say, in some cases, the oh no, no, I'm sure there are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. And and um, so there I, there will be people who volunteer. I mean, I've heard stranger <laughs> things, but but anyone in their right mind probably wouldn't. Or uh, it may it may not. I mean, it's not something I would want to have done or have, want anyone to do. Um, I think that being embodied and in con contact with the universe is one of the essential aspects of who we are. Mm -hmm. We're not just in our brains. We're not just us. We are the way we interact with everything else. So I would find that I'd find that very complicated to say, yeah, you know, we can just have people inside of that. Now, if you had a perfectly wonderful virtual environment prepared for them in advance, and they were going to be hooked up with it in a way so that it seemed like their senses were really engaged then it might be better than, say, a person who is a paraplegic and laying on a hospital bed or someone who is a locked-in patient. So I could imagine that if you can provide that, that's a perfectly valid way to, to begin doing things like uploads. Mm -hmm. But not if you're sticking them into a, in, into a black... Uh, I mean, we've seen this. That there were episodes like this on Caprica, for example. <laughs> <laughs> but th there's also another concern here, and, and that is... Um, because you, you mentioned animals and animal testing. But, uh, and I, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I would imagine that before we start any kind of human experimentation, we have to go through the usual lab animals that we do, you know, rats, uh, eventually apes, and so on. So take, for example, apes. Um, if we start testing whole brain emulation on apes, and we put it on an exascale computer, for example, and we start running that emulation at a faster and faster and faster speed. Would that not even? Would it not occur that this emulation would become self-aware and self-aware at an equal or better level of intelligence than a human being, simply because you have the hardware capability to run the clock faster and faster and faster? Mm. 
I'm not as sure as you are that we would be doing this on apes, but but that aside, it's quite possible that we would. Um, well, yeah, it is possible to do things like that. I mean, you could run an ape brain ten times as fast, or you could run a an incomplete human brain. Let's say you've just got 50% of all the areas scanned or yeah. something like that and run that at 10 times the speed so you've got some very strange intelligence in there. Or um, a fruit fly brain by a factor of a, a billion or a trillion. Right. Uh, now of course just running a small brain a trillion times faster doesn't necessarily make it smarter because you don't know what that's going to do whether that just means that it's doing the same thing that a Drosophila does but a lot faster. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not as easy as that, but there are certainly things there that we can't foresee, that we don't yet understand. But exactly that's my point we'll precisely. Do. Of course, but that's the truth with just about any scientific progress. Uh, every time we're, we're going into new territory, we don't necessarily know exactly what's going to happen. And AI researchers have that same problem. The trick is that you should go forward carefully. You should think about what you're going to do next and what the possible consequences are of what you're doing. So, for example, if you're going to do an, an experiment with a Drosophila brain and then you say, well, we have the emulation, why don't we run it ten times faster? Well, then perhaps while you're running it ten times faster and you're observing everything that it's doing in there, you might not want to connect it to the Internet or something like that. Just, <laughs> you know, just in case. <laughs> just in so, case. <laughs> there's, there's things you might want to think about there. Um, but, yeah, I think at some point when you're working on these experiments, uh, you need to keep in mind where is the difference here between the problems you could face with a whole brain emulation experiment and the kinds of things that say people are worried about in the in artificial general intelligence and what could happen there if there's a runaway intelligence explosion um, and when do we say let's switch to the technology we actually want to use in humans because for instance in humans it's quite likely that we may not want to use a technology where we do one scan and then we hope that we got all the data out correctly and then press go and see if it's correct but we'd like to have something that is more in vivo so that we can test as we go along mm -hmm. so a lot of the the non in vivo techniques we're using right now that's kind of a um, it's a crutch that we're using because it's available now mm -hmm. and we can start working with uh, large data like the data you would acquire from a whole brain and learn how that works but it's not necessarily the data we would ultimately use. In the meantime, we're developing these high-resolution functional probes. So as we get there, we're going to want to shift more towards uh, the in vivo method. And the in vivo method is more like neural interfacing. So it's more like, okay, here we have a live individual, and we start introducing things that can communicate with neurons that are there. Mm -hmm. And in that case, then you have a transition and it's a transition between you now and a transition between you who you are going to be when you are in communication with the uploaded version of yourself let's say mm -hmm. um, and I think that in that case the questions are somewhat different than the ones of the runaway uh, artificial intelligence so at some point you need to decide okay what are the dangers that you could face but you also need to decide when are we going to say that we've done enough experimentation with the crutch that we're using and switch over to the technology we actually want to use in vivo with humans, ultimately. Exactly, and and that kind of goes back to your sort of interest in uh, uh, brain prosthesis te prosthetic technology, because uh, in those cases, my understanding is that you'd be replacing specific parts of the brain, not the whole brain itself, uh, and and that sort of raises the question: if you sort of start to replace different parts, one part at a time. Mm -hmm. At what point do you reach the point that you are a mind upload, and you, at what point you know you're not? So, if you have a certain single area that's replaced, are you a mind upload? Yeah, probably not. I mean, <laughs> and, and and at what if, point if, is it like? And how do you calculate it? I mean, if you have fifty percent of your brain mm. neural activity, or fifty-one percent, is that the point that we're looking at, or is it specific? Uh, brain activity that's more important than other or how where do we draw the line because say if you're a Parkinson's disease or or you suffer from epilepsy uh, and uh, or all those other uh, issues that can be treated perhaps with certain kinds of brain prosthesis then uh, 
the question arises. And, and all those hardwares that would be eventually placed into the brain, they would be able to hopefully be updated wirelessly so that you don't keep, you don't need to keep going in to fix things up. And then at what point do you become a mind upload, really? Hmm, yeah, I think, well, why is it so interesting or why is it actually that important to have a, a definition of when you are an upload? Is it... Uh, well, is be because it would be, it would be not only, because you see, ethical issues started as ethical issues, I think, but eventually end up legal, political and religious issues, right? Because say, imagine tomorrow I have a, I'm a cyclist and I have a car accident tomorrow. I've learned to wear yeah. a helmet, by the way, but say tomorrow my helmet doesn't help. And I have specific brain damage on a specific area. And because you know me and because you like me so much, you create a custom-made device that would replace specifically the damaged area. Mm -hmm. and, and say, from my point of view, I'll be okay, right? But yeah. from my wife's point of view, that I may not be me anymore. I may be somebody else and she could right. say my husband's dead because the brain that was my husband was re cut op operatively and was mm. thrown away was th right. that bi biology of him is gone forever mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. now he has a, a, a brain implant a, a chip of a sort and that's okay. not my husband so, so that, that would turn into a legal right. issue and then a political issue yeah. do I yeah. have the same rights Right. So your um, your personality changed in some way, and she no longer thinks that this is really you. Um, that could happen even without a chip, right? That could happen just by having a lesion in your brain, or through something like Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease. You can change in the way that you behave, and people might say, well, this isn't really the Nicola that I know. Um, does that mean that they take away your rights, uh, declare you dead? Uh, well, you see, but, but let me give you another example, which is very much related to the book I'm reading right now, as I said, which is called MindScan. It's, it's, uh, and um, I'm about halfway through the book, uh, and it's a legal case between the, the heir of a very famous uh, writer who uploaded herself into a new body. And mm -hmm. she had something like $40 billion worth of, uh, you know, property. And then her son basically sues uh, by claiming that his mother is dead, which the biological body was dead, and that even though this thing acts like my mom, therefore, functionally speaking, in terms of behavior, there's no difference, that's not my mother. And mm. that, that's the case in front of the court, uh, and that's at the point of the book that I'm at right now. So imagine, for example, even if my, my behavior doesn't change after the accident, but imagine that the accident is so bad that 50% or more of my yeah. brain, say 60% needs to be replaced. And, and usually in cases like that, I would be dead. But because we know each other and because you like my podcast so much, you decide to replace those 60%. And there's right. no visible difference. You know, I keep interviewing people. I keep doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, my wife, for example, might say, or, or we don't have kids, but say, imagine we have kids. They would say, well... I need to get the million dollars health insurance that my dad had because he's dead. Right. So there are a number of ways you can go with that, right? You could either take care of this problem yourself because you know you're going to have an upload done and you can have contracts drawn up that clearly show that this was where you wanted your, your, your fortune to go. You wanted it to go to this new upload. Of course, that requires that we do recognize the rights of uploads in general, right? So then you need to have that established. but. Again, that's something where we need to begin thinking about it. Like, uh, you know, color of skin doesn't necessarily mean you're not human. And why should uh, the nature of what your brain is running on determine whether you're human or not? So that's, that's another question. You can go there. Then alternatively, we can say that in general, even if someone didn't write up their own personal will in that manner, that in society we recognize that an upload of a person is that person and therefore they have that right. You can go in that direction, but that requires changing laws or uh, making it possible for people to understand that an upload is a real person. Um, and we can try to apply some of the laws that already exist. So, for instance, there are, of course, many court cases where uh, an heir will try to have their, their parent declared um, 
basically legally incapable of uh, not taking of care of mind. themselves and not of sound mind, and therefore, you know, they should should be in charge of the estate. Yeah. Um, that happens all the time, and then you have to have a judge come in and decide: Well, is this person really of sound mind? And then you would hope that if they see this this upload is actually of sound mind, that they decide in the same way. Um, the issue here yeah, in, in, in the book, for example, was that yes, all those things were met, as you said. Uh, the, the 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 woman in case, her name was Karen. She um, she uh, wrote everything that according to her will that the 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 upload would be in charge basically of her affairs. But the problem was that somebody issued a death certificate for the body, and once you have a death certificate for the body. That person's legally dead. But didn't she say that this other thing should have all her property? She I mean, did, whether or not that the, is her, she did, does it really the, matter if it's her? It totally does because the court, because she not only, uh, you know, up uploaded, but she uploaded and her new body was like in her mid 30s or something like that. And wh whereas where she, when she died, she was 85. So she didn't even look like herself anymore. I mean, but, she but looked like a younger if copy I, of if herself. If I make a contract, if I make a will, and I say, I want to give all my fortune to person X, even if that's not me, that's just somebody completely different, why wouldn't they just recognize that and, and give the fortune to person X? Because it's one thing to leave stuff to a person. It's another thing to leave stuff to a machine. So say if, right. if you leave so stuff to So it comes to back to whether you give rights to uploads in the first place. Exactly, exactly. That's what it comes down to. It exactly. doesn't really matter whether it's you or whether it's someone else. It all comes down to do we give rights to other kinds of intelligence exactly. that are not simply biological human beings. Yeah. They could be artificial general intelligences, they could be mind uploads, they could be any other form of intelligence that we create. Let's say we develop a new one in the lab, a, a biological new intelligence that's not human. Or let's say we uplift uh, apes to higher intelligence. Mm -hmm. Do we give rights to all these creatures? And then you have to start asking yourself questions. Where do you draw the line and say, why shouldn't we give rights to these creatures? Is there a difference between, say, a person with an IQ of 90 or a person with an IQ of 120? When do you get rights or don't you, even in humans? Well, we don't make that distinction. We give them all human rights. Yeah. So why wouldn't we give human rights to an artificial person? Well, those are some of the, the questions and issues that I discussed from legal point of view last time uh, with Dr. Lin with Professor Linda McDonald Glenn. And my question to her was, if a corporation could be a legal person or a ship could be a person legally, why would not a sentient being or an artificial intelligence also be a person, right? And and we went into all that from the legal point of view, but of course. Because the, the, the legality or, or law and ethics are tightly connected, but as we know, not everything that's ethical is legal, and not everything that's legal is ethical. Uh, so right. there's there's also that that dimension of complexity there. Um, so so I mean, those are all very important issues that we all and I mean we can certainly we cannot resolve. It's entirely them today. a culture question. It's a culture question. It's about whether our culture is mature enough to tolerate to think in those ways because I mean there are still plenty of places and of mm -hmm. course there were plenty of times yeah. when many groups of people didn't have rights and it was maybe because of the color of their skin maybe because they were in someone's employ they were a serf or maybe because they were female mm -hmm. so you know it, there are many cultural reasons to either give rights or not give rights to people and so it is a matter of the culture getting to the point where they decide yeah that's what we want to do. We think that these are all intelligent beings that have those rights, and then you change the laws, and that's what's considered right. So, so let me ask you. Let me put you in another uh, sort of a scenario and see how you you answer to it. Because imagine that everything that you said is has been accomplished, right? The law recognizes the sentient rights or the personhood of mind uploads, but. During the mind uploading procedure, as in the book, uh, there is an accident. And instead of one copy, there's two copies that are being created. And mm -hmm. one of the copies, actually the first copy, which was sort of damaged, is hidden by the company, the corporation, uh, that does the mind uploading. Yeah. So the question then is, which one is the proper heir of you? 
So you only wanted to have one copy made. You, and you wanted said, to. This yeah. is the one that will be the heir. And then they make another copy accidentally and they hide it somewhere and it's been damaged or something like that. Yeah, it's in a warehouse and they do tests right. on it because it, it, it's yeah, it yeah. stuck somewhere in, say, 10 years ago. The memories loaded up until 10 years ago and mm. didn't load up for the last 10 years. Right. Yeah. Which one is you then? Which one should properly receive your property and be the executor of your you know, rights? Well, like many questions in law, <laughs> I think that's really difficult. It's, it's as if you, know, you, you only wanted to have one heir and you went through a fertilization procedure and they implanted a number of eggs and then instead of one baby you had two babies but yeah. one of the babies was sent out for adoption. And then afterwards, when you die, the second child also requests part of the inheritance. What do you do then? Well, it goes to a court. And then eventually, by going back and forth and back and forth between all the different parties, they come to some sort of semi-agreeable conclusion that eventually turns out to be what the judge decides happens. And I think that's what would happen in this case as well. I, it's like so many other questions where, yes, there are new problems that we need to think about and methods that we need to apply, but very often, it's not as novel as we think it is. It's stuff that we've come across before, and we know how it happens. Exactly, but then, then the question is, do we have two rundowns in the end of the day? And if we do no. have two rundowns, no. No. which one but gets you, to move into your house? Are, you did not specify that these two copies were synchronized and would constantly receive the same memories, so of course they're not both going to be the same individual. You could give them different names. You could say one is Randall A, one is Randall B, and then, boom, you've already got two different individuals. And even if you don't give them the same name, it's just like having several different people called Adam Smith, um, you know, who may be completely different individuals. Mm -hmm. Just because they come from the same root doesn't mean that they're the same person when they've gone on and experienced different things. And what if, what, what if, what if you have an identical copies, a number of identical copies? I mean, we did touch on that issue a little bit on the right, first. Right, but it's the same thing, right? I mean, they're identical copies at the time of creation. Yeah. And in the moment they start experiencing different things, they're not the same person anymore. Divergent they're paths. Different people. Absolutely, yes. But, but, but which one of you should be moving back to your house? after the multiplication period. Say that your biological body is dead. You have right. three mind uploads, identical at the mind of uploading because they, they and, and as you said, they would have divergent paths afterwards and become different randos on their own right. But the question is, which one of them three twins or triplets, let's call them, mm -hmm. just like the case yeah. of the baby you, you gave, right? You wanted one baby, you end up with twins or triplets or quadruplets. Right. So, so which of the babies are you going to take home? Yeah. It's the same question, really. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. That's a good point. My answer would be all. My answer yeah, exactly. would be all of them. That would be my answer. But, but if you're talking about adults, then I don't know which, which one should go into the house, and, and especially if you have a family. Does that mean that your kids would suddenly have three or four dads now? Or your wife yes, would have I mean, <laughs> three husbands suddenly by mistake? In, in, principle, in principle, if you have no changes in culture, if none of our cultural norms change, then yes, you would. I'm assuming that as soon as you have more possibilities, as soon as things are different, then you also get changes in how society works. Just like we have changes now, just because, say, uh, women are able to go out and have a job, they no longer get married at, say, 16 and start having like, 10 babies and, mm -hmm. and then they die. Instead, uh, they, they stay in their job until they're 35 and then maybe they, they go back and have a child. So the way that our culture works has changed and also because people live longer, perhaps they get divorced more often and have different subs uh, subsequent uh, marriages and things like that. All sorts of things about the way our relationships work, the way our society works, they all change given that we have different options due to health technology, due to uh, wealth, due to a variety of other reasons. And in the same way, if you are able to make multiple uploads, then our society will change as well. Probably you will think about some of these things ahead of time, just like you'll think about things like marriage and what kind of relationships you want to have ahead of time and whether you're heterosexual or homosexual and all these sorts of things. You, you think ahead and say, well, I'm going to make two copies of myself. now." 
um, I'm agreeing with myself, since that's going to be me, I will know about this agreement, um, <laughs> that, that I'm going to do this as soon as they're there. Uh, one of me is going to go and have the cottage in the hills, and one of me is going to have the house in the city. Uh, the first one uh, is going to uh, stay with a wife, and the second one is going to just visit the kids every once in a while, or something like that. Uh, these are, you know, they sound difficult, but they're not much more difficult than things like, okay, a divorce and a custody hearing. Mm -hmm. It's um, figuring out how you're going to make your relationships work, figuring out how new social networks are going to work. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's new, it's, 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 but it's not all bad. It's also a matter of having a lot of new opportunities and options. So many new ways of doing things. Now we have friends all over the globe because we have social networks. We didn't used to have that. And yes, sure, it makes things a little different than it used to be uh, because these people are not all the same. They're not all from the same village and they don't have all the same cultural norms and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, opportunities and sometimes complications. So, so, so let me ask you this then, but if the original still exists, does that change anything? Does that make it more complicated? Because as the book would have it, mm. the person who did the mind uploading had a, very, a terminal condition on the brain capillaries that was impossible to treat and basically led to, it, it has a very specific uh, medical name and basically massive stroke and you die <clears> basically. And his father had it, uh, it's Kap Kapirinsky or something like that is called the condition. And his, his father had it at 39 and basically became vegetable for 35 years. And the son inherited it genetically, had the same condition and was basically forced to live very careful life. He couldn't fly on planes because of the changes of pressure. He couldn't do sports. He mm. couldn't do a bunch of other things. And yeah. so at 45, and, and he could die at any moment, right? So he right. had the will yeah. that if he died, he didn't want to be a vegetable. But at 45, he decided to do the mind upload. And yeah. so basically, uh, those people who are the original, they're called skins or shed skins. And the shed skins so the, the, the mind upload, the brain scan takes and plugs into your own place in society on Earth. The shed skins are sent onto the dark side of the moon to live their lives in luxury for as long as they're alive. And provided that they're all aging people, they're not expected to last that long, a few years. Right? However, he goes there and a new scientist discovers a nanotechnology method of curing his disease and he gets cured. Mm. And then he says, I want my life back. Mm. Because, All right. Because yeah. I love somebody, and the reason <clears throat> I didn't marry her is because I didn't want to cause her suffering the way my mother suffered when, her, when my dad turned into a vegetable at 39, right? That's why I never acted on my feelings towards her. And now I mm. want to go back and want to live my life yeah. you know, in the yeah. beginning. And, and so he changes his mm. mind. Then the question is, what do we do with the brain scans, which are already plugged into society and are living his life or their life, depending from the yeah. point of view? Yeah. His argument is, I was first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I can't say what would be right, because again, this is complicated <laughs> enough to take it to a court and try to decide it by getting everyone to agree on something. But there are, once again, similar parallels. It's not an, an, a unique story because there are, for example, the cases of soldier who goes off to war, is missing in action for a long time. The wife then decides, well, I guess he's been long gone for so long, let's have him declared killed in action. So he's basically declared dead. Uh, she marries someone else and then he comes back. My wife's grandfather, case in point. He go. was on an Italian submarine that was sunk by the British, but he survived and lived in India as a prisoner of war for four years. <laughs> right, so this happens and has happened before. Um, and how did those cases get solved? Well, so what happened to your grandfather? Well, luckily his wife didn't get remarried in the meantime. So he, everybody thought him dead and he basically showed up in Italy after the war, four years after everyone's ever heard of him and they knew his submarine was sunk in the middle of the Indian Ocean. So it was a big surprise, but luckily she didn't right. remarry. Okay, so there weren't any additional complications, <laughs> yes. but there could have been. And then, could yeah, have been, then what exactly. would have happened? Yes, right. yes. So, so that, oh, but, but at yeah. least in that case, you can say those other people are biological humans, right? In this case, yeah. you say 
that's a machine. That's a mere copy of me. That's not well, even... Well, but again, that, it depends on the cultural uh, points, right? Because in the past, say, a couple of hundred years ago, any time there would have been a conflict like this, the person with the highest social ranking, say an ar aristocrat, would have won over someone else. So, yeah. no, this is my castle, this is my wife, whatever, exactly. I'm taking them back. Mm -hmm. the, now we say they're all equal. And in the future we can say, well, artificial intelligences and mind uploads are also sentient beings and they have this. We don't declare them, oh, it's just an upload, just like we won't say, oh, that's just a shed skin. Even the terms that you've been using that were in the book, they already give cultural values to something. They say, oh, this is less than or this is worse than, you know, give it, sort of giving it a label that immediately tells you what you're supposed to think about it. And it's done uh, for the a same reason. way that you would have called something a slave in the past or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, but that's exactly what it is. It's about cultural values. Absolutely, absolutely. So let me ask you this. We, we have been talking about this now for about 45 or 50 minutes, and I, I think it's about time to start bringing our interview to a close. But um, based on, or after all we've discussing, we've been discussing, and would you personally, uh, because I know, for example, Dr. Terry Grossman uh, works on life extension technologies, yet himself, he would not like to to undergo or to live that long. He would like to live his natural lifespan and then die, which is a very mm. strange paradox, right? He wrote the book Transcend together with Ray Kurzweil, and yet at yeah. the same time, he doesn't want to keep going along with Ray Kurzweil. And he's serving yeah. customers to do that, and yet himself, he doesn't want to take advantage of it. So let me ask you, do you have a how do you feel about mind uploading yourself? Would you do it if you could? I would. I would do it. Uh, and I've been asked this many times. And, and, but I don't want to say, oh, I'm, I'd like to shed my body as soon as possible or something like that. Because sometimes people think that's what it means if you're interested in uploading. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually rather attached to this body. I really <laughs> I am enjoying it as it is right now. And I don't mind this experience one bit. Um, so. I'm perfectly happy to continue living like this as long as I can, but I would rather uh, upload my mind and inhabit a new body and experience new things there than to become bedridden uh, and incapable of things and have Alzheimer's or something like that. Yeah. So there is some kind of crossover point, and, and I don't know where that is exactly at the moment, but yes, I would take advantage of the technology if it's there. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I feel personally the same way like you. Uh, so for me, uh, ideally speaking, uh, we would ac accomplish sort of life extension without necessarily disembodying our bodies. In other words, through either genetic engineering or through the you know Aubrey de Grey sense uh, technologies and so on and so on. But if that sort of track fails, and if mind uploading is the only option left to me, I, I'd probably, I'd probably give it a shot. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> so we are on the same page on that. Yeah. Um, so, so let me ask you then. We're coming to towards the end of our interview. Uh, for those of our uh, viewers and listeners who didn't see the first one, uh, where can people go and find out more about your work? Well, you can certainly go to the website, that's carboncopies.org. That is the main site right now that's uh, dispensing information about all these things. There you'll also find a link to our Facebook group, which has the same name, Carbon Copies, and you can identify it by seeing that it has the same logo as well, where people discuss all sorts of matters and things uh, related to that. There are a few other sites connected, but you'll find everything by just following the links from there. Fantastic, and I of course would post uh, the links on the on the blog article itself. Um, as usually, I'd like to give the last words to my guests. So, I don't know. This was sort of a very open-ended discussion on the ethics of mind uploading. Do you want to wrap it up in a specific way, or do you want to finish up well, with a certain thought of yours? Um, I, I would like to mention that I think that although we've discussed some interesting future scenarios based on, say, what comes out of books or complications that we can think about, the really difficult ethical questions are quite different and very political and probably worth another entire discussion. There are things such as, 
if you allow people to augment themselves, if you allow people to do things like uploading and perhaps become ten times as fast eventually, then what happens to the people who decide not to do this? How does that impact their lives? And if it impacts their lives negatively, does that give them permission to prohibit other people from taking those steps? So how do you deal with this, um, this sort of, it's not really a conflict, but this concern, anxiety, whatever exists between the pro and con groups, um, and do that in a manner that, that, that works out best for everyone in the end, and it doesn't really take away our, our freedom to explore and our freedom to move forward, but at the same time doesn't put others at risk. Um, yeah. I think those are re the really hard problems when it comes to completing this kind of a technological step. That's that's definitely a fundamental issue, and, and it kind of goes a little bit towards the first issue with, with respect to death and with respect to equality and per the, probably the rising gap between the, 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 the rich and the poor and the, the gap between those who decide to embrace those technology and, and those who decide against it for be it religious or ethical or moral reasons or anything. In a way, we have a small example. Now, let me use your tools here. In a way, we have a small example in, say, the case of the Amish and so on, who are people who do not embrace all of our technologies and sort of choose which parts and at what stage of yeah. their society to embrace them or not. Uh, so we have a little glimpse there, um, perhaps, but certainly the discrepancy that you're referring to would be that you're referring to would be infinitely more substantial so and it would be therefore a much bigger political issue and legal and moral one than than it is right now i think so yeah that's that's definitely something we should consider okay well um uh, let's leave it open-ended i mean i didn't think that we can literally wrap up such a fundamental discussion today and of course, right. I've it's used just that. the start, actually. Yeah, it's the start of a discussion more than anything else. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, exactly. Yeah, because as as we said, the good news is that we have many years, perhaps many decades, and perhaps maybe more than that, to sort of hash through and and discuss and debate all those issues before we actually have the 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 practical sort of uh, uh, reality of them occurring. Right. Yeah. So hopefully by then, and, and this, 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 this discussion is an attempt to, to put the issues out there in a way. So uh, let's hope we're successful. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our viewers and listeners for being with us here today and to remind you guys again, uh, write up a, a review on iTunes for the show if you like it. That's a fantastic way to, to help us uh, spread the word and discuss uh, more uh, interesting issues and bring other interesting guests guests on the show and including Dr. Rando Kuna again for a third interview perhaps. Sure, always up for it. <laughs> okay, thank you Dr. Kuna. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye. Yeah.